Hi everyone, I'm Derek Weeks and welcome to DevNexus. This is, I believe, my fourth year presenting and attending uh, DevNexus and it's always a great show with lots of great presenters and so many fabulous people in the community. I'm sorry I can't be there in Atlanta this year uh, at the Congress Center to join you all in person like we normally do, but I'm back again this year with some great research that I'd like to share with you on software supply chain, software development and innovation and things that we're doing out in the community uh, broadly that my research will show on how we're going to be using machines to make software and really make decisions about the kind of software uh, that, that we're using within our development practices moving forward. So I've been studying software supply chains for the last seven years that I've been at Sonatype. Each year uh, that I've been doing this, I publish a report called the State of the Software Supply Chain Report. And I, I champion the writing of it each year, a lot of the research that goes into it. And I'm going to share with you some of the results from that, uh, from that research. One thing is particularly clear about software supply chains is one, we're more reliant on them than ever before. Uh, and two, things are moving really fast. So for those of you that are unfamiliar with software supply chains, let me just give you a, a brief uh, overview. Uh, within uh, software supply chains, we have our suppliers or open source projects we also have our warehouses or component repositories uh, like Maven Central, uh, rubygems.org, python.pypy.org, the NuGet Gallery, et cetera. And we have software development teams that are using these open source components to produce their finished goods, or in this case, software applications. We, all, we know that developers are using these open source components in order to uh, build applications faster. Why code from scratch what you can download from the internet in a second? And for those of you that follow the Dora research year over year, uh, we've seen that leading organizations in the DevOps, uh, state of DevOps report from Dora are more likely to extensively use open source components for software development. And they're also more likely to be dramatically expanding their use of open source within those environments. Now, each year I come to DevNexus, I share some new numbers about how much open source is being consumed uh, each year. As you might know, at Sonatype, we are the stewards of the Maven Central Repository. And in 2020, we projected that we would see over 376 billion download requests from Maven Central. There are currently over 6 million components, open source components housed in Maven, uh, Maven Central, and oh, well over 10 million people that access open source components from that repository. So a huge amount of volume, and as you can see, it's grown year over year. Last year, <clears throat> or in 2019, I should say, uh, we are at 226 billion download requests. So we continue to see significant year over year increases there. In the JavaScript community with the NPM packages, we also see significant growth. In fact, we uh, expect to see, and I haven't seen the final numbers yet from the NPM repo for uh, 2020, but we expected them to be over 1.2 trillion downloads for uh, for the year there. Now, what does this mean for developers like yourself? This means about 90% of the applications that you're putting together uh, are built from these open source uh, components. It's making us more innovative. It's enabling us to develop faster, uh, and as a result, we're benefiting greatly from, uh, from the use of, uh, of these components and packages uh, within our development practices. For the average enterprise out there, uh, my research through Maven Central and 15,000 different organizations I looked at shows the average organization is consuming about 373,000 Java open source packages each year you're reliant on over 3,500 different open source projects. 
and over 11,000 unique releases of those uh, components or projects uh, each year uh, in terms of the volumes that you're downloading. Uh, by comparison, I don't have the same kind of access to uh, Maven uh, to the NPM repository as I do Maven Central, but the average JavaScript developer based on the download volume that we're seeing is pulling in about 100,000 components or uh, JavaScript packages every year through their development efforts. Now, we know from the State of DevOps reports uh, and people like Nicole Forsgren that uh, published that, uh, year after year that faster is better in the enterprise. We know that uh, elite performers in that uh, report show year after year they're deploying more frequently. They have uh, faster lead times to deploy uh, from commit to deploy. Uh, they have much faster mean time to recover from failure and lower change failure rates uh, overall. But th these are really internal benchmarks on software development performance. And before we get too excited or perhaps carried away with those metrics around faster is better and what we're doing, I want to refer back to a letter that Jeff Bezos sent to his shareholders in 2017. And in that letter, he said, beware of the proxies. Don't get so focused on these performance benchmarks uh, internally or an internal process and how well you're doing that you miss the bigger picture of what's going on uh, out there. Now, while faster is better for the enterprise, we also know that faster is better for our adversaries. So let's take a look at some of the research and, and what we know from this. Now, I presented this uh, this slide at DevNexus uh, before. Uh, it's the story of what uh, happened at Equifax. I think many of us in the Atlanta community know what happened there. But I'll reiterate the one important point from this, this slide is that when it came to an open source vulnerability there, in March uh, of 2017, the, uh, uh, there was a vulnerability announced in the Apache Struts project. There was a safe version of the uh, package made uh, uh, available that same day. Uh, and three days later, the breach at Equifax and other organizations happened. So the adversaries were very quick to prey on a new vulnerability in an open source component at that time. But since that point, we've made a lot of investments across the industry on protecting us from not being the next uh, Equifax, if you will. I run a uh, DevSecOps community survey each year. And in that survey, what we're seeing is a uh, decrease in the number of organizations reporting open source related breaches uh, over the years. Just after the Equifax breach, it was at its peak at 31%. And more recently, uh, we saw 21% uh, of organizations say they had open source related breaches in the last 12 months, which is still one in five organizations, but uh, of course we're seeing progress made there. At the same time, we're seeing uh, adversaries still being uh, very quick to pursue new vulnerabilities in, uh, in applications that are announced. If we look back to the April-May timeframe in 2020, uh, on April 29th, there was a new vulnerability disclosed in the SaltStack uh, open source application. This was a critical vulnerability. If you were on auto updates from SaltStack, you got the new release that day, April 29th. If you weren't, you needed to uh, update to the new version to uh, be safe from adversaries that might choose to exploit that vulnerability. And the researchers at F-Secure that discovered it said this is a patch by Friday or be breached by Monday kind of scenario. And that exact scenario played out. What we saw uh, Wednesday afternoon was the vulnerability disclosure. By Saturday morning, we saw uh, traces of over 18 different organizations on GitHub through conversations there saying that they had been breached, that they had lost control uh, of their environments, that there was code executing in their environments that was not theirs, uh, and effectively the adversaries had taken over. So still while we saw three days between vulnerability disclosure and breach, uh, 
uh, at Equifax and other organizations in 2017, we're still seeing this same kind of adversarial performance in, uh, in 2020. Uh, now, when we look at uh, back at some of the survey work that we did in May of 2020, what we saw is the average organization is able to uh, identify that they have vulnerable open source components, usually about on average of a week after the vulnerabilities have been disclosed. And we see they take an additional week to remediate those vulnerabilities within, uh, within their environments. So if you're an adversary, um, you know, that provides you a big window for how to move, uh, how to move forward and exploit these vulnerabilities. Um, but you also want to seek the most efficient path. And so what we're seeing in terms of adversaries is because we're making so much investment in preventing open source uh, vulnerabilities as an industry, they're moving upstream uh, within software supply chains. They're not waiting for vulnerabilities to be disclosed and then uh, preying upon them. They're actually starting to contribute to open source projects upstream in the software supply chains as a supplier and contributing malicious code um, to those projects, which is then fed downstream into the software supply chains where we are all sourcing open source components, libraries, packages, frameworks, uh, et cetera, that may have this malicious code uh, injected into it. Now we've been following this kind of behavior within our software supply chains for a number of years and through our own research at Sonotype as well as other research out there uh, in the industry, we're able to track an increase in these types of software supply chain attacks, either typo squatting, uh, brand jacking, uh, malicious code injection, or uh, tampering of tools, uh, as we saw in uh, some cases like Octopus Scanner back in May of 2020. Uh, and also not uh, open source related specifically, but um, the SolarWinds hack was also uh, looked to be some kind of tool tampering uh, there. But between May uh, or March 2015 and June of 2019, we saw about 216 records of these kinds of uh, attack approaches. Uh, but more concerning through uh, July 29, from July 2019 to May of 2020, when we were doing this research uh, last year, we saw an increase of 430% in this area. Almost 900 new attacks uh, were recorded for these uh, software supply chain attacks. So uh, again, adversaries are looking to take the most efficient path to finding ways to exploit new ways um, to get into uh, our organizations and understanding how reliant we are on open source uh, components overall. So uh, we already discussed before, faster is better within the, the enterprise, faster is better for adversaries. And I want to come back to, um, you know, if faster is better for the enterprise, is it also better for open source projects? Now you yourself may contribute to uh, open source projects, and you most certainly rely on open source projects, but how do you figure out which are the best open source projects? Well, in 2018, with our State of the Software Supply Chain Report, we started to partner uh, with Gene Kim, uh, author of the Phoenix Project, uh, De DevOps uh, thought leader uh, extraordinaire, and Dr. Stephen McGill at MuseDev to do some research into open source projects. And we wanted to figure out which were the best open source projects out there, not just from a kind of popularity uh, uh, viewpoint or number of downloads those projects were having, uh, but looking at their uh, release frequency, the number of downloads, the size of their development teams, the presence of any tools they might be using, the frequency that they would use to update uh, security vulnerabilities when they were observed or identified uh, in those projects. And I shared some of this last year at DevNexus, so I won't go into all of the details here, but we did find patterns across these different attributes where we saw that open source projects that had a uh, more regular time to update or more frequent updates were also 
the uh, open source projects that remediated vulnerabilities uh, on a more frequent basis. Uh, overall, projects that update more frequently uh, stayed more secure. We also looked at a variety of the different attributes that I shared on the previous slide, uh, update frequency, size of team, presence of tools, uh, et cetera, and we found different categories of behavior within these projects. And uh, we found some exemplars and uh, uh, organizations that focused on features first, uh, organizations that were maybe a step behind in their uh, updates to new functionality or, or updating dependencies on their projects, et cetera. And we found that the exemplars were the ones that released faster, updated faster, uh, et cetera. And if you wanted to pick open source projects to work with, you would want to pick from these uh, exemplar groups. And not to pick for, and not to pick from the cautious or laggards uh, of the uh, open source community that may be very popular. So the higher on this chart that you get, the more popular your project is in terms of number of downloads. But popularity doesn't necessarily equate to the best quality uh, projects overall. And the the cool thing about this is it if we knew what the attributes were that reflected the best open source projects out there, we could train machines on how to look for these, uh, these capabilities. This is actually some of the work that we've done at Sonatype and released in, uh, in 2020 uh, as part of our Nexus lifecycle uh, platform to identify two developers if you're going to select these different open source uh, projects for use within uh, your applications that you're building, which are the exemplars, which are the feature source, which are the laggards uh, within uh, th those projects so that you could then rely on better quality projects. And here again, we're using machines to look for these patterns within and across open source projects. And this is years of research uh, and data that's gone into these findings, but to help you better uh, assess these suppliers that you would use within uh, within your environments. So uh, once we understood or better understood from that research, who are the best open source projects or which are the best open source projects to use and based on what attributes, we also wanted to better understand what enterprises were doing and what best in class enterprises were doing in terms of managing their open source, updating their open source. Did they have regular programs to update open source, automate the update of open source? Did they have policies around uh, open source that, the, that they were using? Were they keeping inventories of the, the open source? Um, and was there a regular program that we could uh, observe across these organizations? So we went out and surveyed about 670 or so different uh, software development organizations, asking them about their, uh, their uh, processes and procedures uh, and so forth. And uh, what we found out was uh, a couple of things, kind of good and bad uh, across these organizations. One is, 21% uh, of these organizations were deploying to production daily. So uh, obviously development uh, overall is getting faster and we see this through other industry or DevOps uh, uh, reports out there. Uh, we also saw that 26% of organizations had no approval required for new open source components coming into their organization. So where, whereas we were looking at does quality matter uh, in these, or do you have any selection criteria, official selection criteria, 26% uh, of the organizations had no approval process required, which says you can bring in anything of any quality. Uh, of course, you've probably used these projects for years, you're familiar with them, um, they're quite popular, but again, we saw not all of those maybe traditional attributes are best used to select different projects uh, going forward. Um, we also saw only a third of the organizations out there were confident that they were using open source uh, that they believed to not be vulnerable. Um, 
We found only 7% of organizations out there could find and remediate vulnerable open source components within a day, keeping them ahead of the adversarial patterns that we're seeing about three days for the adversaries to uh, attack when new vulnerabilities are disclosed. Uh, and only about a third of these organizations knew where all the open source components that they use were. So if they downloaded something, if they used it within their applications, they were actually aware and keeping uh, inventories of those. So uh, let's talk about what we learned in the dynamics of this research when we began to look at various attributes of who has an open source program, who's keeping an inventory, who's doing a regular update of open source components within their environment, trying to stay on the latest versions of those components, et cetera, who's looking at security vulnerabilities and trying to remediate those as, as quickly as possible. So what we saw within these, uh, these organizations were uh, that, that we surveyed were four distinct populations. They were each about 25% of the overall uh, population within the, the survey. Uh, and these four groups, and I'll read from the lower left uh, uh, and then around the other parts of the chart, but the low performers, these were the organizations that were um, uh, not deploying frequently or not releasing software frequently and also not emphasizing uh, uh, security practices or strong security outcomes as part of their uh, development activities. Then we had the productivity first group in the uh, lower right corner. This is the group I would call the DevOps group. These, this was the group focused on speed, uh, but not necessarily bringing a lot of best in class security outcomes to the work. This group, uh, you know, we, we talked about being um, fast or frequent in terms of deployment, uh, but afraid that if they added security practices, it would slow them down. We also have a security first group or the group we called SecOps. Uh, and in this case, these groups were uh, uh, not deploying frequently, but emphasizing strong security outcomes. They had uh, strong security practices in place with their development teams. And these groups also, uh, we theorized, were um, very comfortable with having strong security practices, but afraid to move faster um, as that might slow down, uh, or as that moving faster might impact the security of their, uh, of their code. And that's something they didn't want to do. But there was 25% of the organizations out there, about 25%, um, that were the high performers. This is the group that I call the DevSecOps group. This is a group that found out how to deliver strong security outcomes as well as strong productivity outcomes in terms of how they were uh, releasing software uh, overall. So let's take a look at some of the differences between uh, these organizations and how they were um, uh, developing uh, software and looking at security. First, we'll look at the low performers versus the high performers. And what did we find here uh, within it? Uh, one, the high performers were, uh, the DevSecOps groups were deploying 15 times more frequently. When it came to detecting and remediating vulnerabilities, they were 26 times faster than the low performers at detecting and remediating open source uh, vulnerabilities. Part of this is that they're updating um, their open source components to the latest versions, uh, also updating the dependencies within those uh, open source components more frequently, which enables them to stay uh, ahead on the, the latest releases that generally have lower rates of vulnerabilities, mainly because those vulnerabilities haven't been discovered yet. Uh, but they also had uh, strength and approval processes that they were a lot faster to approve new open source components for use within, uh, within these environments. Now, we also took a look at in this year's report of comparing the security first teams to the high performers uh, as well. What kind of differences did we see in these organizations? And when we looked at comparing um, these two groups. One is we saw that in the high performers, 
they were more likely to be using software composition analysis. So this is automating a uh, view or analysis of the open source components within their environments to understand the quality and security uh, of those components. They were more likely to automate the, uh, the approval, uh, the analysis and the approval of uh, open source components within these environments. And they're more likely to build this automation uh, and use of the uh, SEA tooling in their environments into continuous integration. We're early into the development lifecycle where it wasn't a bolt-on process at the end of a development lifecycle owned by the security teams. These groups were more likely to embed the analysis early in the development lifecycle inside tooling owned by development and it was probably more likely that the SEA tooling was owned by or uh, administered by the uh, development groups in collaboration with their, uh, their peers in security. Now, we also saw that these groups were more likely to uh, produce a software bill of materials or an inventory of the open source that they were using. Those organizations doing that were able to, uh, would be able to track and trace what open source components were out there, which is very uh, uh, is needed in cases where a new vulnerability, let's say, is announced today, you have to ask uh, or answer two questions uh, quickly. One is, did we ever use that component? If so, where? If you're not keeping a software bill of materials or an, uh, an inventory of those components, you're not going to be able to easily answer those questions and you'll be pursuing a scavenger hunt uh, overall within your organization. Uh, these organizations are likely to keep that, more likely to keep that inventory uh, as well centrally uh, in their organizations. Now, here's one of the really interesting uh, pieces of research that came out of uh, this analysis that we did of these organizations and uh, the, the different attributes that uh, made differences between the security groups or productivity first groups and the high performers. Now, remember before when I said the security first groups or the green group in this case uh, was afraid that if they went faster, they would be less secure. And remember when I talked about the uh, bluish uh, aqua group uh, productivity first group, these are the group, this is the group that's moving fast, but they were afraid if I, you know, if they added security practices into their high performance software development efforts, that they would, uh, that they would slow down. What we saw in this case was the high performers uh, uh, kind of disprove the, those, uh, those beliefs. And that if you moved from a security first position to adopt the practices of the high performers, uh, you not only got faster, but you'll see uh, you got higher up or you had more better security outcomes uh, as a result. The productivity first groups uh, as well, if they added more security, they not only got a lot more secure or had better security outcomes, but those groups also uh, got faster uh, on average, as you'll see through this centroid analysis that we did on where were most of the uh, population centered within these clusters. So it was uh, really nice to see that, you know, this theory uh, that, that we had uh, or belief that we had that, you know, we could move fast and be secure at the same time, we really proved out within this kind of cluster analysis more scientifically than just relying on a belief that this could be done. Uh, and the other thing that I will point out in this is that we saw also, not only were they more secure and more productive, but we also saw higher job satisfaction rates within these organizations that were uh, the high performers. So there's a tertiary benefit to moving fast and having better security uh, practices and outcomes. At the end of the day, we also know faster is better. Uh, faster is more secure. Faster helps us stay ahead of the adversaries. And faster also means that we can deliver higher quality uh, software uh, at the end of the day.
Uh, if you would like a copy of the State of the Software Supply Chain uh, report, you can get it in two ways. One, uh, my out of office email uh, is on today. Uh, if you email me at weeks at sonotype.com, it will have an auto response, uh, auto reply message with links to the uh, State of the Software Supply Chain report, as well as these presentation slides uh, here today. Or you can go to sonotype.com slash 2020 SSC uh, and you can uh, download the report there, although you'll have to register to get the uh, report if you go to that link. Um, but either way, uh, it's available to you as well as the slides. And um, thank you to DevNexus again for allowing me to present at this year's conference. It's always a pleasure and hopefully next year we'll be able to see you in person. Take care.